This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. It's time for the Gun Guy TV podcast. Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV and certainly your support of me. I'm really grateful. I can't tell you how grateful I am because it's been kind of crazy recently as we prepare for the memorial of my stepfather. He passed away rather suddenly a very few weeks back of a massive heart attack, and we've been busily trying to get ready for his memorial ever since. I'll talk about that ever so slightly here just a little bit and kind of give you an idea of the progress in case you've been following me on Patreon or if you've um, followed a little bit on Twitter or something, as I've mentioned that. I'll, I'll bring you up to speed, but I won't spend the entire time of the podcast talking about that. As you may or may not know, this podcast comes in two parts. There's the first half an hour, which is free, and you can listen to it free of charge on your favorite podcast player. It also appears in video form on YouTube and the other video outlets. Now, the video form just has a thumbnail on it. There's no video. This is an audio podcast. A lot of folks listen to it on the way home or work or whatever. The second half, which is 30 minutes, is available on Patreon only, and it's meant as a thank you for my Patreon supporters. So if you want to hear the second half, you have to be a subscriber or a member on Patreon. I'll put a link in the description in case you'd like to do that. Now, the first half of the podcast, I'm going to talk about a couple of things, not least of which is the changes I'm seeing, and they're positive changes, i got to tell you, in, in the California, because I live in San Diego County, California, in the California Concealed Weapons Permit structure, or maybe not so much the structure, but the way in which sheriffs because California is set up so that sheriffs issue permits, the way in which sheriffs are changing the way that they issue permits, how many permits they issue, the types of things you can do with that permit, and basically making it easier for California citizens to obtain concealed carry permits that are valid throughout the state. So we'll talk about that in the first part of the podcast. In the second part of the podcast, I want to address a case that happened and was argued before the Ninth Circuit and then an en banc panel called Young versus Hawaii. Now, I haven't talked about that much since it happened in large part because I've been so wrapped up with other things and partially because... Chuck Michelle from CRPA, the California Rifle and Pistols Association, and from Michelle and Associates was going to come on and talk about that with me. But in retrospect, he wants to actually open that up and talk about a, a broader subject. So I'll talk about it a little bit, just what I know about it in my opinion, <laughs> for, for whatever it's worth. Obviously, I'm not an attorney. My opinion, for whatever it's worth, we'll talk about that in the second part of the podcast, because I do have some very strong opinions as to the strength, skill, and effectiveness, if any, and I don't think there was a lot, on the part of the attorney who argued the case for Mr. Young. So uh, I'll also put a link in the description to the actual oral argument in case you'd like to watch the painful argument and put yourself through the, uh, the torture of watching that yourself. But that'll be in the second part of the podcast, available only on Patreon. Now, if you'd like to support this podcast, I would certainly appreciate it. I don't make a living doing podcasts, and I don't make a living on YouTube. And so it actually is something that costs us money to do. So any contribution from your side would be great. Kind of helps us go. And one way you can do that is by supporting us using your Amazon purchases to do that. We have an Amazon affiliate account. And so when you buy from Amazon through our Amazon affiliate link, it doesn't cost you anything to support Gun Guy TV, but we get a little marketing fee for everything you buy. And it doesn't matter whether it's gun related or not. It could be toothpaste or toilet paper, and we would receive a benefit that costs you absolutely nothing. The easiest way to do that is to go to the Gun Guy TV website at gunguy.tv. And when you're there, there is a banner ad on the top for Amazon. If you click on that banner ad, it will take you to the Amazon website through our Amazon link. Then if you bookmark that page, that Amazon page, and go back to that bookmark every time you purchase, then no matter what you buy on Amazon, we'll get a little credit for it. It doesn't sound like it does a lot, and certainly Amazon is not a gun-friendly company, but you can pick Amazon's pocket for a little bit of money for Gun Guy TV, and we would certainly appreciate it. So please do use our Amazon link on Amazon. 
All right, in case you are unfamiliar with how the state of California issues concealed carry permits, I'm going to explain that briefly so you understand what I'm talking about in case you're not in the state of California. And before I get started, before all the hate mail arrives, which it tends to do, let me, let me clarify something. I am of the opinion that the Second Amendment is your permit. The Second Amendment right is for you to keep and bear arms. That is a natural right, a God-given right. That is a right that you have anyway, and all the Second Amendment does is codify that and protect it and guarantee it in our Bill of Rights in our United States Constitution. So the fact that that is protected is all you need in order to carry a firearm, to bear arms or keep arms is as a law-abiding person in the United States, whether you're a citizen or a lawfully admitted alien, doesn't matter. That's your right in this country, and it's protected by our Constitution. Unfortunately, the courts and the government have usurped a lot of the authority of that right, and so as a result, in some places, like California, you cannot carry a firearm unless you have a permit issued by the government to do so. I think that's ridiculous. There's no reason for you to have to genuflect be before some government authority, and, and certainly no reason for you to have to pay them a fee to exercise a constitutionally protected right. And my hope is that one day we will stuff the Second Amendment down the throats of these government agencies and force them to abide by it and get out of the way of our constitutionally protected Second Amendment right. But in the meantime, sometimes we have to be happy for incremental progress. I've lived in California the vast majority of my life since I was a little kid. And so I can tell you that a lot of the rights that we no longer have in the state of California, we lost incrementally. We lost because we weren't paying attention, and the California government stripped those rights from us a little bit at a time, just a bite at a time, like the old saying goes, how do you eat an elephant? You do it one bite at a time. Well, unfortunately, in order to get those rights back, we're probably going to have to eat the elephant the same way and get those rights back one bite at a time. So I am thrilled whenever we make even the smallest amount of progress in the right way, in the right direction, because we're constantly in a position where we feel like we're losing more and we're not gaining anything. Well, I want to encourage you and let you know that we're gaining a little bit in certain areas. And in other areas where we have active court cases, we're gaining even more. Now, that may not be the case with the Young versus Hawaii case, and I will explain why when we get to the second half of the podcast. I'll explain why that's my opinion. But let me talk first about California concealed carry, and I'll give you a little bit of history here. I've had a permit issued by the San Diego County Sheriff's Department since 1990, I think, because my permit was first issued under Sheriff Roach. He was our sheriff for one term only, which is very, very rare with sheriffs. Generally, they stay in office until they don't want to be there anymore. It's very hard to unseat a sitting sheriff. It, it happens but not with regularity, and sheriffs generally don't serve only one term. But in Sheriff Roach's case, he did. And during his first term, I applied for a permit and received a permit from the San Diego County Sheriff's Department, which was valid throughout the entire state. And I pretty much had a permit in California ever since. I took a brief break for a couple of two or three years when I didn't have one, and I went back and got one again. Here's how permits work in the state of California. They are issued by your local law enforcement authority, and the vast majority of the time, that's the sheriff of a given county. Sometimes police chiefs issue them, but very seldom, most times, they let the sheriff do that, and then they'll point you to the sheriff's department if you want a permit. You have to live in the county in which you apply, so they don't offer permits to anyone who doesn't live within their jurisdiction within their county. So if you live in L.A. County, you have to apply with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. If you live in San Diego County, as I do, you apply with the San Diego County Sheriff's Department and so on. And there are 58 counties in the state of California. Right now, the vast majority of the counties in the state of California issue concealed carry permits. Some issue very, very few or none. Los Angeles would be one of them. Uh, certainly another one of them <laughs> would be up in the San Francisco area. I think Santa Cruz is one and so on. But they're, they're actually few and far between. Most of the, I think about 54 of the 58 counties right around there, issue pretty regularly, and then each sheriff gets to decide what the criteria for receiving a permit is. And the reason for that is that the law says that a local law enforcement authority may issue a permit 
to a person who is 21 years of age or older, lives within their jurisdiction, is not a prohibited person and prohibited to have a firearm, and can demonstrate good cause for the issuance of the permit. Now, this is where good cause, these type of good cause requirements, and may issue things really go sideways. Many states are shall issue. In other words, if you meet the basic requirements, you're old enough and you're a lawful resident of that state and you're not a prohibited person, then they shall issue you a permit. Some of them have some training requirements, some of them don't, and so on. And the training requirements change. In California, it is may issue. In other words, the sheriff can say, well, I'm going to issue these or I'm not and be within the law. They don't have to issue permits by law. They may if they wish. And then the sheriff, individual sheriff, gets to decide what in that sheriff's mind constitutes good cause because the state law does not define the term good cause and say good cause is, is equivalent to X, Y, or Z. It's up for the sheriff to decide what good cause is. Now, traditionally, many of the sheriffs have defined good cause as well, you're a friend of mine, you're a family member, you're a wealthy person in my county who's contributed to my campaign, or whatever the case might be. And very recently, one of the sheriffs in the state of California has found themselves on the wrong side of the law by going about this, well, you contribute to my campaign, so I'll issue you a permit thing. And if you want to know more about that, I'll put a link in the description so you can read about the progress of that case. But it looks like at least some people in that sheriff's department may be going to jail for doing that because that is actually illegal. Nevertheless, illegal or not, they've been doing it for a long, 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 long time. And so at one time, it was very difficult to get a permit. Um, in San Diego, for example, it was very difficult to get a permit unless you made contributions to the sheriff's campaign or you were a family member of the sheriff or a friend of the sheriff or you were a member of the San Diego County Honorary Sheriff's Deputies Association because in order to become a member of the association, you had to contribute a certain amount of money. Those guys very easily got permits. Well, this is all totally illegal and unconstitutional, but it's nevertheless what's happened in this state. I would label that and call that corruption. You can call it whatever you want, but I'm going to call it what it is, and I'm going to call it corruption. Now, in many cases, and certainly in the state of California, among the 58 counties, San Diego being one, that has changed a lot. And I'm going to tell you more about how that's changed and the positive things that are happening about permits and with permits in San Diego County in a minute. One of my favorite gun stores is Sprague Sports. They're in Yuma, Arizona. They are my favorite for a few reasons. First and foremost, it's just a terrific store. It's sort of a, a little mini Bass Pro Shop. And as my wife can tell you and my son can tell you, if I get in the Bass Pro Shop, you'll never get me out. And one of the problems with walking in that place is when I walk out, I've spent a lot more money than I intended to. Well, Sprague's is kind of like that. When you walk in that store, you feel like you've walked into a Disneyland if you like hunting, shooting, or anything about the uh, firearms or the shooting sports. So I do urge you to check out Sprague Sports in Yuma. Now, there's another reason why I support Sprague's, and that is that since I'm in San Diego County, California, if a firearms manufacturer or dealer wants to send me a gun to review, they can't send it here 99% of the time. Richard Sprague, the owner of Sprague Sports, has been kind enough for the last couple of years to allow manufacturers to send those guns to Sprague's. I can drive out to Yuma. And while I'm there, I can review the gun, I can go on the Sprague Sports indoor range, and I can spend some time firing that particular gun and, uh, and really getting to know it, shooting some great video, and I can actually produce the video and produce a review of firearms that I cannot get in the state of California. And the only way I can do that is through an FFL in a free state. And that's Sprague Sports. So I urge you to support Sprague Sports. No, they're not paying me to tell you this. I'm just incredibly grateful for all of the support they've given to me and to Gun Guy TV. And frankly, I really like the store. So check out Sprague Sports in Yuma. If you happen to be going down Highway 8 and passing through Yuma, make sure you stop at Sprague Sports. I'll put a link to their website in the description. <laughs> The opinions expressed by the gun guy are always right, unless they're wrong.
Now let's get back to the concealed carry history. I'll try to make it a little bit more brief of California. First of all, permits were very difficult to get, particularly in major metropolitan areas. I know in San Diego County, when you would go down and apply for a permit, the licensing division of the Sheriff's Department would go out of their way to try to convince you not to continue with your application, to discourage you from working toward getting a permit, to make it as difficult as humanly possible for you to get that permit. And then when you got the permit, particularly under our current sheriff, he would limit the tar out of it so that you could only do certain things with it. He would put things on it like for business purposes only or only while going to the bank on Thursday afternoon between one and five or something like that, you know? And so you couldn't take the gun with you all the time everywhere because he would limit it so that even when you got a permit, most of the time it was fairly useless. He would only issue it to business owners and for only for business purposes, or he would only issue it if you, if you weren't a business owner or you weren't somebody that he knew or a family member or a famous person or whatever, you had to demonstrate that you'd had some real threat to your life, that you'd had multiple threats, that there were restraining orders out on that person, that that person looked like they might harm you. It was almost as if you had to be in the hospital having been almost killed before he would issue you a permit to defend yourself against being almost killed. It was that ridiculous. In fact, I have an employee who's a really good guy and I wanted to make sure he had a permit for work as we were teaching classes and that kind of stuff. And so I sent him with a letter from me, from my, from my company, saying we needed him to have a permit, and this was the reason why. Now, he lives, or actually he doesn't anymore, he did live up in Fallbrook, which was north, almost the extreme of north San Diego County, almost to Riverside County. And the sheriff's department, I had to tell him, I said, Steve, look, you understand that they're going to try to talk you out of it and they're going to make it difficult for you. And so they're going to try to frustrate you and make you mad. And if you come in and express any kind of anger or upset in their presence, they're going to say, oh, well, you don't have the temperament to have a permit. And that's going to be the end of your application. So if you get upset or mad, do it in the car on the way there or on the way home or whatever. Or say it to yourself from the inside of your house. But just be aware of the fact that that's a tactic. They're going to try to make you mad or they're going to pester you and, and see if they can get you to give up. Now, he didn't quite believe me, but certainly what they did is they, they would call him and they'd say, uh, well, actually, we need this one document. Can you bring that to us? Well, and he'd say, well, can I fax it to you? Can I email it to you? No, we need an original copy. Can you bring that to us? And so he would have to drive for an hour and change from his house in Fallbrook through the traffic all the way down to the Sheriff's Department Licensing Division to drop off this one document. And then three, four, five days later, they'd say, oh, by the way, we do need another document. And this is what they did to him, one document at a time. They made him drive that distance each and every time over about five or six or seven documents. They knew what they needed. They knew what they needed ahead of time. They could have said, we need this list of documents. Would you bring them all in? But they didn't. The tactic was to make it as tough on him as humanly possible. He called me a couple of times on his way there, just absolutely beside himself, furious. You know, And I'd say, well, talk to me about it and let it go now, because when you get there, you need to be polite, respectful, and so on. You know, And he did actually get a permit. It's been many years now, and every couple of years he renews it, and I have to sign that he works here and that he still needs the permit and that kind of stuff, and he goes down and gets a permit. But this is the kind of nonsense tactics they used to take in the Sheriff's Department in San Diego County. And many departments, like the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, were so bad that you didn't have the chance of a fart in the whirlwind of getting a permit. I don't care how dangerous your life was or what kind of danger you were facing. Well, enter Ed Peruta. Ed Peruta sued the San Diego County Sheriff's Department, and it went all the way to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, he won... And then he lost, and then he won, and he lost it. I mean, it went on for a while. It never made it to the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court refused to hear it, which was very unfortunate because he actually won, if memory serves me correctly, with a three-judge panel in the Nutty Ninth Circuit, and then it went to an en banc panel, and he lost. He appealed it to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court decided not to hear it, much to the chagrin of Clarence Thomas, if memory serves me correctly. He was quite upset about that. He wanted to hear the case. Nevertheless, it cost the Sheriff's Department in San Diego so stinking much money 
that they finally just acquiesced when Peruta won the first time in the Ninth Circuit and the three-judge panel and said, we're going to do whatever the law says. That's fine. We're going to follow that. And while this whole process was going on, other sheriff's departments in the state were watching that and seeing that the San Diego County Sheriff's Department was hemorrhaging so much money for this court fight that they actually started reevaluating their issuing policy. Most notably, the Orange County Sheriff's Department, under Sheriff Hutchins at the time, actually started issuing. They kind of did so like sticking your toe in the pool to see if the water's cold, a little bit at a time. But then it became a very open county that while they can't call themselves shall issue technically because the law says the sheriff may issue, for all practical purposes, they pretty much are shall issue. If you're a resident of Orange County and you are a lawfully permitted person, in other words, you're not a, a, a person who can't have a gun, you're not a prohibited person, and you're over the age of 21 and you would like a permit, it's very easy to get one in Orange County. That's been the case for quite a while now. And what they've done is they've automated the system. You can apply online now. You don't have to spend time after time after time showing up delivering documents like they did to Steve. A lot of things changed during that time. In fact, I have, because I've had a permit so long, I've noticed a, a tremendous change in the attitudes at the Sheriff's Department in San Diego. Now when you go down to get a permit, they will tell you when you're trying to get a new permit, they'll tell you, the clerk will just say to you, you know, my job is to help you to get your permit. Well, that's a 180. Let me tell you, their job before was to try to keep you from getting one or get you so discouraged you'd quit. Now it's, well, no, my job is to work with you and help you get a permit. A totally different world. So if you're in San Diego County, for example, and that's where you live and you've not applied for a permit, I suggest that you do so. Well, you know, it doesn't cost you anything unless they decide to approve it, just so that you know. You don't have to pay the money up front. The other thing I've noticed, too, is that in renewing the permit, Every two years, you have to renew the permit. And every two years, it was like a cage fight to get the permit renewed. They'd, they'd try to, to discourage you anew. They'd ask you for extra stuff they didn't ask you for before. They'd look at you sort of with stink eye, you know, across the counter and try to make you feel as uncomfortable as possible, as if you were this puny little sort of amoeba-type thing that they were going to grant this enormous privilege if you actually behaved yourself exactly so, even though... Keeping and bearing arms is a constitutionally protected right. That's the way they treated you. It was like going into the Department of Motor Vehicles and walking up to the window of the person who's had the worst morning and the worst day of their life, and now they're taking it out on you. That was the experience you got from the Sheriff's Department when you went until Ed Peruta. Now, when you go to the Sheriff's Department, they're happy to see you. They try to get you in and out as quickly as possible. They get it all organized for you. It's amazing. In fact, here's the interesting thing that has happened lately is that they've made an actual change to the physical nature of the permit, and they've made a change to the number of guns you can actually put on the permit. Yes, we're still stuck in that place where you have to list the actual guns you're going to carry on your permit. It used to be super limiting. Now it's not. I'm going to tell you more about that in just a minute. While I'm on the subject of concealed carry permits, I probably should also talk about concealed carry coverage. The reason I mention it is because it's no longer just concealed carry coverage. For a long time, a lot of those companies came out and covered you if you were carrying a firearm and if you were carrying it legally in a public place. Or maybe if you defended yourself in your house, but you had to defend yourself with a firearm. I don't think that's the case with any of them anymore. Now it's more defense coverage. It's self-defense coverage with any legal weapon is uh, some of the phrases I've heard among some of these companies. Well, so that means a skillet would be a legal weapon if somebody tries to attack you in your house uh, or a kitchen knife or a folding blade that you have on you legally or a firearm or any other weapon, whether it's a, a weapon that's simply a common object that you use because it happens to be available, or a firearm or something you're carrying as a defensive tool. One way or the other, though, I do encourage you to have some sort of coverage. And I'll tell you which I, coverage I have in just a second. But if you watch the cases of Kyle Rittenhouse, for example, or the McCluskeys, McCluskeys, however they say that, and what they did standing on their porch just to, de to defend their house, these folks 
end up in criminal court and civil court. And unless you have a lot of money, you're begging the public for help. So it's super important that you have some sort of financial support there for your lawyer and your legal battle, whether it's criminal or civil and those kind of things. So in an effort to try to prepare for that, I hope I never need it. I do have that kind of coverage, and I've actually established some affiliate relationships with the companies that I use so that if you want to use them, it also benefits Gun Guy TV when you do. So let me tell you the coverage I have. As my plan A, I have CCW Safe. I found their coverage to be the most comprehensive and the most complete, and I really like the way they laid it out and what they did with it. So I have CCW Safe as my plan A. But it's not the only one I have because I like to have a plan B. And frankly, I like to have a plan C for when B doesn't work if possible, because what I've discovered is, as a lot of the old military guys say around San Diego, two is one and one is none. So I don't like to have just one shot at something. I want to have at least two. And if I can come up with three, I'm going to have a third one. Well, my plan B is second call defense. Those are the two companies I use. CCW Safe is my plan A. And if for some reason that doesn't cover it, second call defense, which will kick in and take care of it after that. And then we do have a plan C, and that is our umbrella policy from our insurance policy for our home and rental properties, our business insurance, and those kind of things, depending on what I'm doing and where I am, will also kick in to try to defend me. But if you don't have any of that, that's fine. At least get yourself at least one, at least have a plan A to cover these expenses. And if you're going to have a plan A, then I would suggest, if you can afford it, CCW Safe, because that is the most complete coverage I can find. And if you want something a little bit less expensive, perhaps, check out Second Call Defense. Now, I'll put a link in for both of those in the description with our affiliate links, if you'd like to do that. You can also go to our website at gunguy.tv and click on the banner ads on the side of the website as you scroll down, and it will take you through our affiliate to link to them, so that if you choose to use one or the other, it'll help us out as well. Shooting straight and always right on target. This is the Gun Guy TV Podcast. As I was saying about Ed Peruta changing the whole idea of concealed carry issuance in the state of California, I think mostly just out of fear. The, the sheriffs were afraid to have to blow all that money on that case after they watched what happened to the San Diego County Sheriff's Department. So some of them started issuing more, for lack of a better word, more liberally, more freely than they had before. And over the years, that has progressed and improved and improved and improved to the point where in San Diego right now, if you go down and apply, as I said, they'll tell you their job is to help you get a permit. They never used to say that before. And then they'll kind of walk you through the process and make it a little easier for you to get a permit. I've seen people, because I should stop here and tell you, I actually teach the course as one of the instructors to teach the course for the Sheriff's Department on concealed carry so that people can meet that requirement and go get their permit. The people I've seen come through the course are people who are getting permits now for quote unquote good cause statements that never would have gotten them a permit before. Not even close. They would have been thrown out of the office for not having sufficient cause. And yet they're getting permits now for very simple good cause statements. Basically, the sheriff said when he was running for re-election, bring me anything other than I simply want one and we'll look at it. That means you just got to give them some reason beyond I just want it for self-defense. That might be I live in a kind of a sketchy neighborhood or I have to drive through a, a rough neighborhood a lot to go to work or I have, you know, anything like that. Now, those things, if you brought them before, would never get you a permit, but they, they seem to work now. Now, I was contacted by the Sheriff's Department as an instructor to be told that they are moving to an online system called Permidium. That's the name of the system. It's the same system owned by, uh, not owned by, but used by the Orange County Sheriff's Department. And a lot of the sheriffs in the state are moving to that. It's quite a process to get it installed and move into that online system from what they've been doing for years. So they're not quite there yet. But a little bit at a time, they're moving that direction. So when you go get a permit now from the Sheriff's Department, I just updated mine, you get a plastic card that actually looks like a professional permit. However, since that plastic card has not yet been approved by the California Department of Justice, you also get a paper 
permit you can fold in half. It's the same paper printed out permit that you've been getting for years. I've been getting these since 1990. They used to laminate them. Now they don't. They just give you the paper one so you can fold it in half and stick it behind the the plastic ID card version that they give you, and you can put that in your wallet. And But it's the interesting thing is the plastic one, while it looks really professional, is not really official. The paper one is. Go figure. So you can take the paper one, leave the plastic one at home, and you're still good, but don't do it the other way around. you got to have the paper one with you everywhere you go. However, the fact that they're moving into the 21st century in this application process and giving you an actual permit that actually looks like something that might be produced by the government is very positive. I think that's a great move forward. Now, here's the other thing they've done. As long as I've had a permit, I've been limited to only three firearms I've been able to put on my permit. That's it. You got to pick three. That's all. Yeah, I mean, it's fine for me because I'm prone to wearing the same kind of stuff. We live in San Diego County where we don't have extreme weather. And in the summertime, it's kind of warm. So most of the year, I'm wearing a T-shirt and cargo shorts and flip-flops or sneakers or something. Well, I carry a snubby revolver in my pocket most of the time because it fits into the cargo shirts pockets in a, in a uh, pocket holster. Very comfortable to carry around. I carry an extra speed loader and a little holder on my belt and a speed strip. And that's all I have most of the time. Now, if I'm wearing blue jeans or something, or I'm wearing something else when the weather gets a little cooler, then maybe I'll carry my Smith & Wesson M&P Shield 9mm. And those are the two guns I carry most of the time. I have a Springfield XD Subcompact 40 on my permit because I could have three, but I hardly ever carry it. It's generally the Snubby Revolver, little 38, it's a Taurus Model 85, or my Smith & Wesson M&P Shield. That's what I carry the overwhelming majority of the time. Now, what's neat, though, is that the Sheriff's Department has now decided that you can carry an unlimited number of firearms, and you can have those listed on your permit. Now, the problem is that every two years you have to go qualify with each and every one of those, and I think that will end up being such a pain in the butt that they'll end up changing that. And I'll mention what I think is going to happen in a second, or at least what I hope is going to happen as we progress into a better world where concealed carry permits are concerned in the state of California. But right now, you can put on as many as you want. Well, I have guns that I carry when I'm scouting for hunting. I generally carry my Smith & Wesson Model 66 357 Magnum if I'm hunting uh, or if I'm scouting. Sometimes I'll carry my Ruger SP-101 357 Magnum. It's a three-inch barreled gun, a little bit smaller. Well, I wanted to have those on my permit, and I have a couple of other ones. I have a 1911 and like that. I won't carry those except in very special circumstances, but... The fact that I have them on my permit allows me to carry them concealed, which means when I'm driving from California through California to the other state I'm hunting in and I have that gun in my car, I don't have to worry about having it locked up and unloaded and separate from the ammunition and all that other nonsense. I can just stick it in the center console of the car or I can stick it in a case and put it behind the seat of my truck and it doesn't matter because it's on my permit. And so that allows me to do that. Now, what I think is going to happen because I'm running out of time here on the first part of the podcast. But here's what I think is going to happen. I think that what's going to happen is people are going to do what I did. I now have seven guns listed on my permit. I have a buddy who's got, I think, 12 or whatever. And people are going to start having, they're going to start complaining about having to qualify with all of these. And eventually, I'd be willing to bet you that the California law will change or the practice, perhaps, of the sheriffs will change if it's within their purview to do it so that you are simply qualifying with a revolver or a, an auto loader, semi-auto. And if you qualify with a revolver, you can carry any revolver. And you qualify with a semi-auto, you can carry any semi-auto. That's my, that's my hope as the next logical step. I don't know if it's going to happen, but that is, I believe, what happened in the state of Nevada. And then after that, people got a little tired of that. It got to the point where in Nevada, and I do have a Nevada permit, by the way. In Nevada, you just qualify with anything and you carry whatever you want. But they still went through this rather logical progression of opening it up and making it freer and freer and freer and freer and freer. My hope is that if, even if we have to get it incrementally, eventually what ends up happening is we just end up constitutional carry around the country. And this whole permit nonsense simply goes away. That's what my hope is. But I'll be thrilled. I'm thrilled that I was able to add four more guns to my permit. They're guns that I do use. I won't carry them on a regular basis, but the fact that they're on my permit makes them easier to transport. And if I ever want to carry one, I suppose I could. The other thing, though, is that I, I can just see the Sheriff's Department becoming more open to issuing and issuing a lot more permits. San Diego County has issued a tremendous number of permits since Sheriff Gore opened it up. 
and they are swamped. They're so swamped, they added extra staff. They've gone, they're going to a more automated system, and they can't keep up with the demand. Well, that's very exciting. The more people there are on the street who are honest, law-abiding people who are armed, the safer I feel. And I suggest that the safer you should feel as well. Well, that's it for this part of the podcast. If you're listening on your favorite podcast player, thank you very much for your support. I really do appreciate it. If you're listening on Patreon, I want you to stick with me because we're going to get into the next part of the podcast on Patreon only. But like I said, if you're listening to the free version on your favorite podcast player or on YouTube or one of the video distribution centers or areas, a gun streamer or bit shoot or a place like that, thank you very much for all of your support. Thank you very much for listening and wherever you go, whatever you do. Be safe. You've been listening to the Gun Guy TV podcast. 